I'm Mark Seifter. And I'm Linda Zias Palmer. And this is Arcane Mark. Welcome everyone to GM Tools Plots and Intrigue, where we tell you how uh, uh, to work a sort of more complicated intrigue plot. We take your questions from the audience and we workshop ideas about an intrigue game. So first, let's make sure we know what we're talking about when we're talking about an intrigue game. So an intrigue game is usually defined as a game that is not just a combat filled dungeon crawl, but more often one that has social confrontations. It might have focus on relationships, secrets and plotting. And it's sort of a, a game that has a more complicated plot going on behind the scenes rather than more of a, uh, Basically, it's a game that is probably the opposite of uh, Fighter Squad versus the Throne of Chaos, where you just slap down a flip mat and fight things. And that's not to say that you're not going to be fighting things in an entry game, but the, the combats aren't really what defines the game. It's the, it's the skills, it's the plans that both the NPCs make and that your PCs are going to be making to face a variety of social challenges or infiltrations into locations or other things like that. Co yeah, I guess combat is one tool at an intrigue character's toolbox when something needs beaten up. So, um, that's what an intrigue game is. But a lot of GMs have trouble running an intrigue game in the Pathfinder system. The Pathfinder system has a rich world full of opportunities for an intrigue game, but some of those opportunities are more like what our publisher, Eric Mona, calls opportunities when there's just a lot of products that we have to do oh, no. and work extra time. Oh, no. Here uh, it comes. Because they're, they're, they're like problems that have been recast as opportunities. Just say it. Just say it. Just say what? You're not going to make me say it, are you? Say what? God damn it. You're going to say problematunities? Yes, he calls them problematunities. Well, he first just called them opportunities. Fair enough. So, my main point, though, is that they are opportunities, but they're also sometimes difficult to deal with, especially when it comes to certain types of special effects. So, for one... Divinations, so you should check out our Divinations episode, which is episode two, to find out more about Divination. But just in general, in an intrigue game, what's really, really important is something that in Ultimate Intrigue we call measures and countermeasures, which essentially states that if you have some kind of special technique or spell that deals with something, there's probably some kind of counter and different people working in an entry game are equally likely to focus on the special counters as they are to focus on the spells that are causing different issues in the first place. It does mean that if you have a spell that doesn't look like it has any countermeasure, you uh, might want to homebrew a new spell for your mm -hmm. game that is a countermeasure so that the PCs and the NPCs will have it available and that they're not just in a situation where there is no countermeasure or where, or a situation where there are too many countermeasures that, that handle everything. It's kind of like um, the history of war where just sometimes defense was at too much of an advantage and it was just very entrenched and sometimes mm -hmm. offense just was at a huge advantage. You kind of want more of a balance where you have interesting but costly countermeasures that you're not going to be able to do every time, at least not without a cost, and interesting things that you can do. And Opportunities. In yes. And in terms of striking that sort of balance there, ideally you want the you want your players to feel like the opposition is putting some effort into countering them, but not like the opposition is being unfair in the degree to which the opposition is prepared. So one of the things we talked about in the Divinations episode that I think is worth reiterating here because it's not just about divination it doesn't just apply to about divinations it also applies to like how much security um you, you know if you're doing like a heist or something how much security does the uh vault have or things like that oh we just thanks for subscribing bacon golem thanks bacon golem welcome um so 
So the idea there is that uh, is to use the what sort of the measures to what the lengths which the PCs are going is a good gauge for um, balancing how prepared the opposition is, how many countermeasures the opposition has. And if your players make comments like, well, of course they'll have these spells cast, so like we better come up with countermeasures for those, and they just come to assume certain things, then it's probably a good idea to, to take your cues from your players, like if they're expecting these kinds of countermeasures and they want to feel like, okay, yeah, they're going around them, then you should probably place them. On the other hand, if you have newer players, players who aren't as familiar with this, this type of system, having NPCs who come in and they've got like 17 layers of, of protection against what the PCs are doing can, can make it feel unfair. So sort of dynamically choosing that difficulty based on your player's level of experience. And it's also, if you're running a longer running intrigue campaign, you definitely have the room to, to start with the, the lower levels of countermeasures when they're lower level, they have access to fewer resources. You get a feel for what your players are like and how, how much they want to go into this. Well, they did this, so I better do this type stuff and then sort of scale it up as they as they grow more powerful based on their interest. It's important for countermeasures to seem like something that is part of the world, part of the NPCs, part of the PCs toolbox, rather than just like something you pulled out of your ass because you didn't like what they were doing. Mm -hmm. Because those two get very opposite styles of responses from players. Players feel invested, they feel like they're in the world when they can guess and and this is part of the world, and they feel like you're just out to get them if it seems like it's just something that you made up on the spot. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, if you found a spell that, that is more like a cane toad, like we talked mm -hmm. about in GM Tools, the appropriate time to tell the PCs that you are creating a countermeasure spell for it, or the players, is not like right after they cast it, and then it didn't work, but they didn't realize it, and then five sessions later, the when the NPC reveals, aha! I was a demon all along, and I used a new spell you didn't know about that mm -hmm. protects me from detect demons, because we talked about detect demons as sort of a cane toad spell um, that has no countermeasures. The appropriate time is when you read that detect demons has no countermeasure except like mind blank or uh, flat countermeasure, and you tell the uh, players before you even use it, hey, spells like detect demons or detect fey or detect aberrations or any of those spells detect animals don't seem to have any countermeasures beyond a just a flat countermeasure. So I'm going to make there be in the world a countermeasure for each of those. So you can take those two. And then a while later you use it in the adventure so they know that that's there. Mm -hmm. Or if you are going to invent that kind of new ab ability, instead of having it be like, you know, a special innate ability that this NPC has, maybe you have like an arcane researcher who's like, or spy master who's really invested in inventing spells that are going to be able to counter things. And then that actually at that point will become a plot point. And then if the PCs defeat this person, then they can have those spells for themselves. But like, the, the, I guess the idea is that if you are going to have these kinds of unfamiliar countermeasures, then that would become sort of a mystery in themselves. Like, why aren't our things working? Like, oh, now we have to figure this out. And if we figure this out, then we can have a new powerful tool in our arsenal. That's right. Rocket Lettuce asks if uh, we've been converting Ultimate Intrigue spells to PF2 for the War for the Crown game. Mostly no, because some of the core rulebook spells and adding some uncommon spells later in are um, pretty good already for what you need in War for the Crown. And so it gets a real intrigue feel. There's definitely been some things I've converted for my PF2 War for the Crown game, which is actually starting right after this stream. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they're in part four, they're getting there. Um, Linda's a player in it, as we mentioned before. But... Um, we, and we will get to talking about some of the subsystems and converting to PF2 definitely in the stream. Wanted to put out some basic principles first. Bacon Golem says an Arcane Spy Master sounds really cool. Mm -hmm. It's definitely a really interesting um, archetype. Well, Not like a, mm -hmm. a mechanical archetype. Well, I think about it sort of from the perspective of um, Eliza Petcholangro and how she's established in the setting, the uh, venture captain out of Galt where she has like this spell that she's invented, Petulangra's Validation, that helps her get through the disguises of people who are in front of her. And she's... Is that the one where she collects blood samples from yeah. Pathfinder agents and then she can figure out if that person is the real person based on a blood connection or a doppelganger? Yeah. So so I, I think that if you look at the stuff that we've released in Pathfinder Society for Eliza Petulangra, then... Uh... 
then um, that sort of has that kind of idea with it is someone who, you know, she's got her people who are acting in disguises. She has all these countermeasures, things like that. Statler says, playing right after the stream, just bring the camera along with you. Well, it's a remote game with people who are across the country. I think mm -hmm. everyone's in the country now that, that Han moved from Singapore. Oh, yeah. I think, wow, we're actually all in the country yeah, now. Yeah, I know. But, it's but shocking, the two of us are but... the only people who are actually physically here. And so it would kind of, and I'm not going to be like sitting at this computer where I then see all his GM notes. So it would kind of be like, Point the camera at Linda, who's playing over at the couch. I also don't think our group's play style is super, um, whatever the video version of photogenic is. Yeah. Uh, just because of the fact that they like to do really complicated stuff, and sometimes they plan for, like, 45 minutes before actually doing anything. And we have a lot of fun making our plot. No, so, it, so we're, everyone we're in the group has of, fun yeah. spending 45 minutes planning the thing. I just don't think that Twitch would have fun. Oh no, I agree. I agree. For forty-five minutes, because some of that is is also debate when when Twitch would be like, no, do the plan that Cedric said. Yeah. Don't listen to. Uh, don't listen to Linda. Her ideas don't. Don't listen to Linda <laughs> and Aaron. Their idea of um, of going back and, and killing um, Lissy's sister is is a different. Hey, uh, up. What. So that's a different campaign. That, that's yeah, that's Shade Region. But that was one where um, where yeah. Cedric and Evan, or no, the, Evan was the swing boat because yeah. of the fact that his character's wife, his entire people would get genocide if they didn't do your plan. Yep. Anyway, so but, but the, <laughs> I, I, guess, I guess the point is that we're not necessarily we wouldn't necessarily be the most entertaining group to watch. We are an example of the kind of group for which the GM wants to use heavy duty countermeasures because. If the GM didn't, then we would just stomp over whatever the adventure had to offer. Well, fortunately, I don't have to use that many countermeasures in War for the Crown just because there's not as many things to counter in BF2. Yes. But I still need some countermeasures. War for the Crown has a fair number of them up already, fortunately. But we do have the, uh, the Diviner Wizard from Cedric, who usually mm -hmm. plays Diviner Wizards, I oh. guess. No, I mean, always. I guess he's done it twice. He did a but... rogue and a ninja, but... Yes. Um, he's either he's either he, a diviner or he's skulking in the shadows. That's true. And he, he, let, he leaves eyes around from the diviner focus spell, like, everywhere. So whenever something's coming around to flank them or come from a direction that they've been before, they always know. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So let's see what we've got here. So we, we talked about measures and countermeasures, which is one of the most important uh, things for the GM and the players to think about in Intrigue. Another thing that's important in an Intrigue plot to think about is the fact that since everything is not just about dungeons and beating people up, a lot of it is about interpersonal connection. Mm -hmm. So it's about things like who is loyal to who. And who appears to be loyal to who? Right. <laughs> who seems to be loyal? To be betrayal, rewards that are based on things other than just money and the stuff that you loot off of the dead bodies of the things that you killed, but that could be like a night ship or um, mm -hmm. an alliance with someone. The benefits of prestige and social access and connections. Right. As opposed to just pure gold. And one of the things, we said that there are problematicities uh, about some of the measures and countermeasures of magic in an intrigue game, but one of the ways that an intrigue game actually can be easier to run is the fact that because social connections and appearances are important uh, in an intrigue game, in a non-intrigue game, if there is let's say a museum mm -hmm. that bad things are happening in it um, and someone says let's burn down the museum and it's just a dungeon crawler like there's not always anything you can do other than say well the museum's made of obsidian so you probably can't burn it down because it's the black rose museum <laughs> um you don't want to burn down the black rose museum the black rose museum is gonna like open a portal to the dark tapestry in its basement or something like that Whereas in an intrigue style game or one where social dynamics is more important, if, you, if the PC say, well, we're going to burn down the museum, and then you say, but 
if you burn down the museum, then Lady Dasselaine mm-hmm. is going to be very upset because she owns the museum. Mm-hmm. Um, and and she's she, one of your political yes. patrons. <laughs> and she asked you to help with the problem in the museum. So if you come back and say, ha, well, there's the good news and bad news. The good news is there's no problems in your museum. The bad news is there's no museum. Ah, there's just a pile of ash. <laughs> Um, then you don't really necessarily win. Uh, Statler says an entry game sounds like it's heavy on the role play. That's definitely true. You can have a lot of role playing in a game that's not really what we classify as an entry game. Uh, just because sometimes people role play a lot in combat heavy games or in games with other themes. But there's often a correlation between intrigue and a lot of role playing. GM Reckless said has a Call of Cthulhu game where we found a way to resurrect someone, even from Ash, and then someone got bit by a werewolf. We killed them, cremated them, in the hopes we'd also find a cure for life. <laughs> That's pretty interesting. That's legit. I mean, I guess that comes right? down to, like, is the curse, is that going to be able to burn away and purify the curse as well? Creativity can be very important in, in an entry game. And I guess, I guess that, that comes up to that comes up to another another point is uh, rewarding creativity. Like, I mean, that's the kind of thing that if players came up with my game, like, even if I hadn't been thinking about, like, oh, yeah, this will c- totally cure lycanthropy, I'd be like, oh, yes, you know, this should work because this was super creative and it was awesome. And entry games really have, um, and, you know, have a lot of flexibility to explore um, creative solutions for sure. Yep, absolutely. Creative solutions and creative rewards, like we said before. Also, just thinking a little bit differently about even a combat or a conflict. In a non-entry game, usually a conflict end in a more straightforward game with just, like, killing the other side of the conflict. Mm-hmm. But in, in an entry game, there's a lot more bargains. There's compromises between groups. People are willing to say oh hold on hold on okay don't kill me Mm out this is what i can give you or maybe you're not even fighting them in the first place and you have verbal duels Mm -hmm. for sure in war for the crown as you guys as you know from from play through it they've been able to verbal duel a lot of the um the end bosses of war for the crown into just giving up yeah, well, why it's it's why why shed their blood when you can just convince them that it would be better if they went along with your ideas? That's right. You guys kind of verbal duel stomps. Uh, the boss of part two. The, yeah, poor um, poor wizard's cousin. Yes, poor the poor cousin of the wizard PC. We definitely verbal duel stomp him. But you know what? Like, it works out better for everyone in the end. Like. It wouldn't, have, it wouldn't have been good if we actually ended up having to fight him. It's at least, if, I mean, it wouldn't have been good for our political position, and it wouldn't have been good for him. So, you it know, It would have been win-win. good for the crazy cat neutral vigilante who yeah, was planning on killing whoever won that fight. but <laughs> we didn't want to work with her, so. Okay, fair enough. If you uh, want to learn more about her, play War for the Crown. Yep. And then also in entry games, even more so than usual, um, secrets are important. Like, I remember, I don't remember which rule of Dungeon Craft it is, but one of the rules of Dungeon Craft from the old Dragon Magazine was whenever you create something new, also create a secret. Mm-hmm. And this is doubly true in Intrigue games. It just makes things more interesting. There are secrets to find. There is more secret information that makes it so that NPCs or other parts of the game don't always act exactly the way the PCs would expect them to act. Like they're not acting rationally, and sometimes that can lead a PC who's really tuned into the game to be able to figure out what's going on. And mm-hmm. it's a different style of playing, it's sort of maybe a different kind of intelligence, and it can sometimes use a different kind of player that is not as engaged with some of the other aspects of the game. Yeah, and um, I think it also creates just this different paradigm where when you're playing these kinds of games, you're running these kinds of games, the players then don't expect everything to be what it appears in face value and they're thinking about what kinds of other secrets they may hide beyond maybe hiding behind things and like what mark was saying about how you know if someone is behaving in a way that's like well that doesn't seem to make sense maybe there's something i don't understand here these kinds of things can be their own mysteries and then you know 
Uh, one, one of the things, too, is that if you're introducing a lot of these little sort of mini mysteries, then you can see which ones really captivate your player's attention, and that can lead to all sorts of interesting exploration. And if it's something that's captivating their attention, then, you know, you can, you can really pursue that. And I guess it also gets back into if you want it to be something that the players are going to be figuring out, a mystery, that kind of thing, the rule of three very much comes into play, which is any time that you want the PCs, to the players, to figure something out, you want to have at least three solid ways for them to get there that are distinct from each other so that you can sort of bring them onto that path. Yep. And for sure, there's ways to engage players with different elements. You need to know what your players are into and what their strengths and weaknesses were. Like, we had a player back in college who his strength was he would attach to plots and especially like the metaphysics of fantasy settings and i was just homebrewing and making up my own like weird magic system for ninjas in this one setting <laughs> and he just understood it and the other players like were just like oh yeah okay that bad guy did this thing and then he was like well no based on the way that the mark described the way that the ninja powers work that must mean that he has corrupted his flow to the uh, to the elemental ninja powers and i was like that is true <laughs> but, but it is a mechanic i made <laughs> is a mechanic i made up and i did describe the elements to everyone but so like that was his thing is he would figure out how i mean he was like deeply into physics as well as well as like real world mysticism it was deeply religious so maybe he was he just had a really good way in his head of combining those things yeah but he was just something else he just could always figure out what was going on with the magical it was, wasn't like he read a book about it i just made yeah. it all up so it's definitely true that in an intro game that you want to play to your player's interest because if they're not deeply invested then it might just be you who thinks you're going to be running Intrigue Game and they're yeah. not going to be playing an Intrigue Game. That, that's a really good point. You want to make sure that you're, you have buy-in from your players because, you know, sometimes if you have a group that wants to play the more combat-heavy focus thing, then you're you're sort of like that GM who has the, the giant diary of all the complexity of your beautiful world that no one else is going to appreciate and you don't want to you don't want to be in that position where you're putting lots of work in and it's not what your players are looking for yeah you could be like i spent a hundred hours and now here it is you guys you're in a noble court and you have to decide whether to help the northern um the northern dark family or the southern banister family yes. in in their extreme noble thing and here's a 100 page and the gems uh, and the players are like uh we kill them both and then take their their dragons and their dire wolves mm -hmm. uh, and then we go and we ta and we try to find um a kraken in the ocean <laughs> <laughs> well i think i think that also um uh, I, I think that also speaks back to the general idea of the degree of preparation and detailing that you do relative to what the players are going to do. I mean, and, uh, that's also a rule of dungeon craft. Which is also a rule of dungeon craft. The the idea, I think that the idea that James likes to give is like spending hundreds of hours lovingly detailing a town, and then like your first session, the PCs decide they want to like go off and explore something else, and they don't they don't care about that town. It's like don't Aww. create something that uh, detail something that you're not gonna need. And Statler says, "Play to my players' interest means I never include puzzles." Well, um, yeah, there's some people who hate them, and James doesn't like them. For instance, he wrote mm -hmm. a forward to a um, one of the Council of Thieves um, volumes, I think, mm -hmm. talking about how much he doesn't like them. Whereas, like, Joe and Jason Keeley really, really love puzzles. And yeah. you could probably see, listen to their puzzle seminar when No Direction puts it up from Paizo Actually, uh, official, the, I noticed uh, yesterday when I was looking things up that uh, two days ago, the... Um, all the like coverage of the um, of PaizoCon went up on the official Paizo Twitch channel. Okay. So you can That's check all it out the there. videos, but what yeah. about the recordings? Um, I don't know. I can I don't know. Hey, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I think that the puzzle one was recorded, but um, audio, but was not a video. All right. <laughs> So we'll have to, we'll have to, yes, Alex, uh, they're, the about no direction. When are the, um, the, 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 the uh, seminars that were recorded, when is that audio going to be up? We're getting an answer from someone in chat. It is from the no direction network. 
while he's uh, over over the next month or two, says Alex. That well, is that is what I thought. That's awesome. why I said so there, so there's your answer there. when it goes up. Yep. They after have, after they have editing, edited. that's a lot of hours of editing. I do not envy you folks. Yeah, that that is why I didn't expect it to go up. Cool. So if you're thinking, I want to run an intrigue game, and I don't know which kind of game would be an intrigue game. There are a few types of games that are typical for this, and one of them I alluded to with my example there. You can have like a Game of Thrones style backstabbing nobles that's wait is one that of what you meant by dark and banister yeah i guess so <laughs> yeah you can have a game where everyone are criminals that sort of like any kind of heisting or just general criminal game like any of the any good movie or book you read mm -hmm. about um about you you know ocean's 11 leverage any yeah. kind of uh we're all criminals we're gonna do some crazy heists uh, you could do sort of poli a political drama, mm -hmm. like your favorite political drama. Uh, you could do something that's more cops and robbers, like a law and order type thing. And you can just put everything in there. Because why not? With, pol with politics and... Nobles killing each other and criminals and everything else. Seller asks, any PFS scenarios that focus on intrigue? Wondering if it works within a single scenario. Why, yes. Um, so the scenario that has the greatest percentage of intrigue focus is uh, Bid for Alabastream, which has one combat and the rest of it is a giant influence slash, is a giant influence system intrigue party. Um, there's What's also, the name of the one with the Sun Orchid heist? Uh, let's see. The is that this just the Sun Orchid scheme? Yes, the Sun Orchid. The scheme Sun Orchid scheme is a heist. Is a heist where you are hired to be white hat white hat heisters to test the defenses on a caravan that does not actually have Sun Orchid elixir. That is one of the decoy caravans because they're sending out a bunch of caravans, one of which actually has Sun Orchid elixir. And there's also you the, find uh, out that yeah. at the very beginning, so it's not a spoiler to it. It's less of a spoiler than that the Alabaster has one fight and the rest is intrigue, at the very least. Um, there's a lot of other ones. Black Rust Matrimony. There's a lot of Azza. others that have a, have the influence system in them, yeah. which we will be talking about probably right after we do this and um, those Pitch Aha! Uh -huh. It looks like GM Re Reckless has also seen Leverage. Magnamar, Leverage. The Lord, Lord Mayor, Mayor takes, takes what, what he wants. wants. We provide leverage. So if you haven't seen Leverage, it's a it's a TV show where the uh, the heroes are uh, or the main characters rather are um, performing heists on a bunch of shady and unscrupulous individuals, today, and it's super entertaining. Today on Arcade Mark, we describe a popular television show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a pretty fun show. The Lord Mayor is just kind of not a very good person. Yeah, you I know. I wonder how he gets reelected every time. Well, you know, he may not always continue to get reelected, especially when we have, you know, uh, if we have a, a good opportunity to show how things have updated in the world and how the time has advanced to the present date, you know, you might see that some of the elected leaders have, have not indeed sat in their positions for over a decade. Aren't there term limits or something? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, there are a lot of other Pathfinder Society adventures that are based on different intrigue themes, including uh, there's one with, that has verbal duels, but very unfortunately, it was the first time anyone ever experienced verbal duels, and you were asked to lose a verbal duel, mm -hmm. the first time you ever learn what it is, and you don't know how it works, so... Un That's to seal to seal the to shadow. Seal the shadow. Unsurprisingly, yeah. there were bad reactions to this system that nobody knew, except for that you're doing the opposite of what you would normally do. Mm -hmm. And I think it's never had another um, Pathfinder Society scenario. But some of the other intrigue subsystems. Well, one of the things that uh, one of the things that I found as a as a developer for Pathfinder Society is that any sort of subsystem is introducing additional rules for the for the GM to use. So if it's not a subsystem that we've used a bunch of times, like we know that there's gonna be some some backlash for that. So we sort of have to weigh like, to what extent is that going to be critical to bringing across a good scenario and things like that? Are people gonna like it, stuff like that. 
And I know that there's GM backlash because there's extra prep. Mm -hmm. There's player backlash. Player backlash because it's, it's like, especially when, when whenever it's a subsystem that abstracts something else, like mm -hmm. mass combat, it's like, my character does plus 900,000 damage. Why can't I just kill this entire thing? Why do I have to play this subsystem? Mm -hmm. Or my character has plus 200 to um, knowledge religion because I'm a lore oracle. Why do I have to do the research subsystem? Yeah, I just know everything that's in this library. So we have we have some that we, we have some that we use more often, like the uh, like the PFS, the the Pathfinder Society changes to um, to the chase system, the influence system, research things like that. But mm hmm. All right. So speaking of all these subsystems all the time, let's talk about them a little bit in games, and we'll also talk about converting them to Pathfinder Second Edition. Mm -hmm. which is something that people want to do. Let's start with Influence. That's one that is in War for the Crown all the time. Um, so Influence is a subsystem that, like, sort of... The backbone of that system comes from some Pathfinder Society scenarios that Thurston Hellman wrote that sort of had the idea of you get certain number of successes in a certain amount of time to influence these people. But... It was only fully described and expanded in Ultimate Intrigue when it was written by Linda. So, yeah. So, with the influence system, um, the fundamental idea is that um, is to sort of expand the way that you interact with people so that it's not just based around uh, diplomacy checks and um, other, other diplomacy, bluff, and intimidate and those prison-based skills so that you can influence people with all sorts of skills to engage everyone in the party. It sort of break, it breaks down social encounters into, um, into phases during which um, every player has a chance. Another, another thing too is that, so, so both for, from the perspective of the skills and also from the perspective of the structure of the system, the idea is to make sure that everyone has a chance to participate and to balance the contributions of both the social butterfly character and the character who maybe is maybe is going to be sort of going around the room assessing the situation. Maybe they're a cleric who's using their knowledge of religion to to help win over a uh, to help win over another religious leader or something like that. So you've got the system where you have the the, uh, the encounter is broken up into a number of phases. Um, in each phase, each player can each PC rather can try to either influence someone um, using one of their skills or they can try uh, what's called discovery to try to learn something about that NPC um, with sense motive or in uh, in second edition that just becomes perception which means everybody has it which makes it work a lot better um, so so you either are trying to discover something about that NPC which may be something that learning more about what skills are good to influence them or bad Learning about what kinds of things are uh, what kinds of things are they particularly resistant against? What kind of strategies and topics do you not want to bring up around them that might give you penalties? And conversely, what kind of strategies and topics might that they have a soft spot for? Maybe if you start talking about those things, then you'll get some bonuses. So you sort of have these these two levers of learning more about how to effectively influence someone and influencing someone. And then for each person, there's going to be skills that are good at influencing them great at influencing them and not so good but you can still try them and usually those usually those like diplomacy type skills uh may fall into the like you can still try them but they're not going to be the best thing in this particular at this particular time so those that's sort of like the core of the influence system and it works just it works just well in uh second edition without uh without changes like we've talked about other than since motive to perception and we've talked about this on several past episodes so i don't know that's if we true. really need to get into this too much more now here but i don't think so but it is important to note that if you're converting you don't actually have to convert just don't use the chart that is literally in the influence system mm -hmm. of the base tc use the chart that is literally in the core rule book for yeah and edition. then you gener generally you'll want to use like the you'll want to look at the easy dc as a benchmark and the core rule book for like when it's supposed to be easy and then like the standard dc and the and the challenging dc Yep. And then and then follow the other guidance that's in there about about I mean, DCs and character levels. The chart and that's in uh, the influence system is not that far off. It goes up in Pathfinder one chart goes up faster than the Pathfinder mm -hmm. two chart, but it starts lower. Yeah, but you want to use the Pathfinder yeah. two numbers. But, but if you decided that you were like, 
I am dogmatically not converting <laughs> anything except that I'm changing the skill things. I don't have time to convert these numbers. I don't want to. I just want to run it out of the AP. Wait, but the GM. The, if you wanted to do that for some reason, it has another chart. For for some reason, okay. you could. Okay, I think this is a very <laughs> unlikely. <laughs> Um, Rocket Lettuce, Influence does not have a chart in the core rulebook. Everything has a chart in the core rulebook, and Influence can use that chart. A chart, don't for, a a chart, chart for chart. determining DCs is a GM. Or I suppose it's technically a table. But it's a, whatever. It's a way yes. to, it's a, it's I'm a guideline. I'm the one who called it a chart, so. Well, I'll call I always it call it a chart. Whatever, it's technically a table, yeah. Yes. Um, but. It's technically true, Rocket Lettuce, but. <laughs> yes. But yeah, definitely you, you make a social stat block for these influence mm -hmm. and they can get pretty complicated because in an intrigue game you can have someone with fake identities, secret goals secret, that secret they agenda. have, they can hidden, have biases. Uh, hidden goals, true, uh, an, an obvious goal that is not the real goal, biases that you can't discover with discovery checks where they're just like biased against half orcs because their father was killed by an orc or something like that. Yeah. And they'll also have descriptions of their personality and their physical appearance. So sort of the, the design of the social stat block is to to sort of encourage the GM to put in the kind of information that would be needed, or the, the adventure writer to put in the kind of information that you would want to have for, for running the characters. And also, um, one thing that's important, what, the more NPCs that you have in a room, once you have more than like two NPCs, is being able to distinguish them in some way. And th this isn't just for running influence, but just in general, whenever you have a large number of NPCs appearing at the same time. So having them have differences in personalities, in manners of speaking, um, one aid that helps a lot for a lot of GMs is having art for each of the NPCs that you can sort of hold up to be like, you know, this person is speaking or whatever to, to try to make them clearer. Um, a lot of Pathfinder Society scenarios that influ have influence will have sort of guided notes that list the names of the NPCs already and like a few basic things the Venture Captain might have said in advance. So you can do something similar to that. To give your to give your players some more guidance, um, especially like and in, to sort of guide them toward taking notes for for what they need. Because especially if you have um, sessions that take place and you have large in a home campaign, you have large gaps in between sessions. So for War for the Crown, I've been doing this for the for the uh, for the table as the as a player, where I take notes about what we know about what each each NPC, and I sort of put up the art for each NPC on our on our little campaign wiki so that's really helpful for people who are like wait who is this again then we go to the wiki and it says like wait this is what we know about them and then that's maintained separately from the gm notes and so the the gm knowledge and the player knowledge are, are kept separate and so that, you're way, an intriguing... that way on the wiki you have what what is it like 12 different theories of the night swan it's more than 12. Oh boy oh yeah we have pages for like our theories about different npcs and stuff like that so it can be really helpful to have a player who who sort of takes I think that most role. of them are fake oh yeah well most of them are ridiculous because the ridi basically if someone proposes a theory then we put it up there and the, if people laugh about how absurd it is then I put it up there even faster. I'll how many of the PCs were listed as possible? Most of them. That? There's also like a stack of halflings in a trench coat and like... Why does everyone think everything is that? Like Norgorber? Well, you see, Norgorber being a stack of halflings in a trench coat like actually kind of makes a little more sense than a lot of the other theories that we have. Even though I'm like almost 100% positive that's not actually the case. I just, I like, that's my headcanon, okay. I'm pretty sure that it's definitely not true based on War for the Crown Part 5. Yeah, but you've not played yet. Okay, well, he can still be stack of halflings in a trench coat in my mind for a little longer then. Fair enough. So, let's see, another subsystem that we have also converted to Pathfinder 2nd Edition is Verbal Duels. They work much more easily in Pathfinder 2nd Edition by a lot. Influence is basically the same except for you use perception so more people can participate because everybody's got it. Mm -hmm. Verbal duels just legitimately are drastically easier to run and there's a reason why that they are. The reason why they're easier to run in Pathfinder 2nd Edition is that Pathfinder 1st Edition had a lot of mathematical recalculations to deal with the fact that there's no such thing as a fun verbal duel in the Pathfinder First Edition math. You have to take a bunch of the bonuses out and turn them into rerolls, the edges. Because otherwise it's just like, let's do a variable duel. All right. Um, Bad O McNoble is here with Diplomacy plus 20. That's really good for level 5. How did he even get that? Oh, wait. PC Diplomancer has Diplomacy plus 59. 
Well, all right, let's roll off. Oh, never mind. I have taken out my diplomacy hammer. With my diplomacy hammer, I smash your encounter. Well, that's okay, um, PC. You get a minus two on all diplomacy checks if, for repeating the same tactic. All right, I shave a tiny bit off the front of my diplomacy hammer. 57. Boom. But the Noah's 20. That's pretty good at level five. And ah. then suddenly nobody else talks and Diplomancer wins the duel, um, even if it was a multi-way duel. So... Fisiko has a question about uh, the influence system um, for making, how do you make the influence stat blocks on the fly? Do you have any suggestions for making that? Yeah, so in general, um, the core aspects of the social stat block are going to be, um, if, you, if you've already, it, it's sort of like an NPC general personality. Um, you're going to want some skill that's good at, some skills at three tiers of, of quality of influencing them. One that's easy, one that's kind of average, and one and, and one that's harder. In general, making diplomacy be one of the harder ones, unless there's a good reason why and why not, um, is, a, is a good call. At least for, this is this I'm speaking for, um, I'm speaking for um, first edition. That wouldn't necessarily be the, the fully the case for second edition, but in general, like, having those more interesting skills, particularly yeah. in the e It e looks e like this big note is also talking about when they thought there would be combat, yeah. but then there was a social encounter. So... You usually have a step block for that creature since yes. they're gonna fight it, or that character. So you'll know what their you'll I'm saying you'll know you'll what, know what their deal it. is at, yeah. at the least somewhat. They will usually if it's a published adventure describe them a little so you can try to get an idea of their biases. Yeah. Um, from that. So you'll generally you'll generally want at the core of it you'll want a skill that's good at a skill or two that's really good at influencing them a skill or two that's moderately good at influencing them and a skill or two that's not great but still works. That is you'll usually diplomacy. It's usually diplomacy. Uh, you'll also want generally to have a either either some biases because of the, because of the uh, because of the existence of discovery checks you may want biases but more importantly you'll want uh, strengths, strengths and weaknesses. And weaknesses. So that there's things that are particularly good against them, or particularly particularly bad against them. Um, so there's certain certain things um, like just thinking about some core parts of that NPC's personality. Um, like do they do they value do they value sort of strength in, in the in your approach? Do they do they um, might there be might there be religions that they favor if they're like a religious person? Just kind of thinking about what that NPC stick is. Actually, Linda, let me take it out of the generic into a specific example that I just make up. So okay, that we yeah, can... sounds good. All right, so Biscuit Goat is running an encounter. The encounter's name in the adventure is Orc Smash! Exclamation mark. All right. Here, at, at, in the encounter, it says four Orc warriors waylay the PCs. They demand all the PCs money. Whether or not the PCs pay them, they kill the PCs with their falchion. Now the PCs say, well, we want to get these orcs on our side. Let's turn it into an influence. Okay, so... Um, so what would you do in that situation? And, okay. Oh, yeah, and th the only thing it says in the stat block of the orc is, it, it just says orc, pay vestiary, page, whatever, morale. Well, the orcs um, are only here for the money, but yet, for no reason, they fight to the death. Okay. So they're only here for the money, but for no reason they fight to the death. Yes. So that implies to me that they have a very strong warrior culture. And so that it's very important that they sort of carry through with their fights and that they would disdain cowardice. So I would say in this case that PCs who can make a show of that, that you would be able to influence them well with a show of strength. So maybe some maybe something like climb, you know, things or like acrobat athletics, athletics, athletics in second, and second edition. edition, sort of like strength and dexterity based skills what about where you show CMB your physical in first prowess. Edition? CMB, because you can have things that are not, you can also have ones that are not directly skills. CMB, you can even have like an attack roll or something like that, potentially for influencing them. I would say that, I would say that be, things that would be strong against them would be like presenting a strong face, presenting your case clearly, like going up to them and being like, no, this is what you need to do. So is that intimidation? For them, for them, intimidation would be a, probably a pretty good skill for influencing them, whereas... Whereas if you're using bluff and you're trying to dance around with your fancy words, that's probably not going to be very effective. So I would put intimidate is going to be effective against them, and bluff is not going to be very effective. Diplomacy may be somewhere in the what middle. What would be of this a game. weakness for these orcs? 
Well, given that given that they've come and they're all about the money, I would say that if you if you pay, if you bribe them or pay them, then it may be easier to influence them. Whereas if you insult their strength and try to be like, oh, you guys suck, you should just give up, then that's going to be... So that would be a strength. That would be a strength. That, that, that would make your... That would be you your... Make it, you get a penalty if you insult them, you get a bonus if you bribe them, and you want to influence them with strength-based things and dexterity-based things. Do you think, do you think things they would have a bias? Maybe against dwarves? Yeah, they might have a bias against dwarves, and they may, they may prefer... They may possibly prefer talking to half-orcs. Okay, so there we go. This is an example of, I tried to make, like, the most generic and not useful for making an influence <laughs> uh, encounter that I could, and Linda still made an influence entry for that. So if she can mm -hmm. do that, uh, hopefully with the much richer actual adventures than the one that I just put up here, yeah. you'll have enough information. And then if you're, if you have, like, say you want to have four different orcs and you're doing, like, a whole different influence thing, one, maybe one of them is the, maybe one of them is, like, the, the orc shaman, and so you may be able to use some sort of more religious or mystic knowledge to help against, to help against them. You can certainly, when you're having to do it on the fly, if they're more similar NPCs, having similar strengths and weaknesses among them, like, that, that's totally okay. Like, they, you don't all have to be different. That's fair. So back to verbal duels. Yeah. They work more easily in second edition because you don't have to recalculate any numbers you could just so they pick their tactic and their skill and they don't recalculate they just use that skill it does mean that you need a different way of generating edges since edges wound up being very important in verbal duels but they a lot of the way you got them was by turning away the bonuses that broke the verbal duel system if you kept them into edges but there's plenty of ways to generate edges it's in war for the crown so far I can generate them based on just how well you guys have done in the campaign. Like, I gave you a bunch of edges for having a ridiculous number of, like, rebellion points and stuff that were called loyalty points, but it was very mm -hmm. confusing. Uh, oh, yeah, and Biscuit Goat says that your example helps a lot. Yay. That happens a lot to Biscuit Goat as a GM uh, with the influence. With Glad the, help. With the, ah, uh, we want to make friends with these orcs. I mean, it happens a lot to Linda, too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Although we don't always use an influence system when we want to make friends with crazy, weird things in um, in Kingmaker. But, so verbal duels, at least as we've tested them out in 2nd um, edition, have worked pretty well. Uh, the important thing for running a verbal duel is to make sure that you get a good description from each person about what they're doing. And then try to make it like sort of an exciting back and forth. If you like the sort of randomly over the top courtroom drama of Phoenix Wright with like objection, objection! or somebody just interrupted does some crazy <laughs> thing, you could take the idea of that back and forth. And honestly, a courtroom is perfect for a verbal duel. In the verbal duel section, um, I ordered a piece of art where um, Quinn is in Cheliax and Abigail Thune is the judge. And he's, like, pointing the uh, uh, Phoenix Wright objection finger at, um, I think, Seltiel. <laughs> Seltiel's just, like, the smarmy prosecutor. Speaking of, speaking of games we can and stories we can highly recommend, Phoenix Wright is... Phoenix Wright is very funny. Really funny. Uh, if, you, if you're into those kind of visual novels that are kind of goofy, but have a little bit of investigation. Um, in We Explain a Popular Franchise Again. <laughs> Um, but yes, if you go to the Verbal Duels page, you can see that Quinn is, P P Quinn is being the Phoenix Wright with the weird prosecuting Magus, who's just like, I still am showing part of my shirt, even though I'm in a courtroom. And then Abigail Thrun is the judge, because that would, would be what would happen if in a Phoenix Wright and yes. Galarian. That, that would, would totally would be what definitely happen. happen. It's like, oh yes, I'm just gonna let you do whatever you want, Seltiel, since you also worship the Dark Lord Asmodeus. And then like you just have a random devil that shows up and like gives testimony and like and then some someone summons a ghost or whatever. Like you could totally do Phoenix Wright and Galarian. That would not be hard. <laughs> um and you would use verbal duels probably. Yeah. And they would represent, maybe you could use them in the same way that the Phoenix Wright games use the, like, those, like, lawyer hit points of credibility. Yeah. <laughs> um, because that's basically, the credibility is similar to the resolve that you have in Verbal Duels. So, Alftira loves Phoenix Wright. Um, so Verbal Duels are definitely a interesting way to sort of explore a back and forth as sort of a kind of hit point mechanic that's for 
social hit points. Even if it's not exactly a duel, you can still use the verbal duel mechanics to, for something else. Uh, for example, if you can use it for a long-term PR stint where mm -hmm. there was social hit points that the PCs and the enemy PR group have, and instead of round by round, just you say a witticism back, the PCs, like maybe in between adventures, are like, oh, we'll put out a flyer that says that um, those guys love the Whispering Tyrant. Uh, um, and then you could play it out over a long term, and you would still be lowering their resolve, but you might call it credibility. And then they would respond, and you would, might change the names of what, or sort of the themes of what the tactics are for um, the verbal duels if you were using it for P, uh, for a PR firm and be like, oh, wow, they said that they, they, they love the Whispering Tyrant would probably be that tactic of um, of mockery, I think, would um, would be the tactic. And then they could use like a red herring, which is like mm -hmm. the price of potions is very cheap <laughs> at our potion store. What does that have to do with anything? It doesn't matter. We were losing this back and forth. <laughs> we need to start a new narrative. And you can, and it's it's really fun to just actually literally role play that out, and and I think that when you actually when you actually play it out too, it helps to show why just repeating the same tactic over and over again doesn't like why the mechanics and the rules say repeating the same tactic over and over again doesn't work because then when you as the player are like trying to come up with different ways to say similar to go with a similar attack with different words, like it just doesn't come out as nice. Like real, it's realistic. You're just saying again. It's like, they yeah, but that thing is like, and the, and the NPC is like, you just said that. Like, come up with new material. They love the Whispering Tyrant. They love the Whispering Tyrant. GM Reckless says, all hail the living God, not that undead schmuck. Yeah, well, you know what? <laughs> Razbeer is doing a whole Vichy France thing where, as it said in the blog, he's just sort of giving some bodies to the Whispering Tyrant to keep the Whispering Tyrant from attacking Razbaran. So... That shows who the real power is. It's time of fun. <laughs> I guess, but for influence, there's also the uh, there's also the organizational influence system. That's true. Organizational influence offers like an interesting way for characters to sort of have a reason to tie themselves to in world organizations and get some real benefits out of it. And then that's also an ultimate intrigue. And then so so in terms of in terms of converting that one over, I'm I'm trying to think about it because because that one I, I wrote that one too, but I haven't really had as much of a chance to to use it. But there is a sense that um, there is a sense that as you get, I, I guess what you would do is you'd be converting the general benefits that you receive to be appropriate benefits. But there's different sort of ranks of that you would have with different organizations depending upon how much they like or despise you, and that was uh, that was one of one of the fun things about writing up the system is writing up what does it mean for an organization to hate you, and it's actually pretty true to what you'll see in adventure paths and things like that, and, or long going campaigns where you have the villain who at first is willing to expend like a few resources because the PCs are a minor annoyance, but by the end of the campaign, like the leaders of the organization are willing to risk their lives to bring about the PCs' downfall. That ties in with the nemesis system too. Where villains get nemesis points, and that had the picture of like them killing Drugami or like no! using Hakon as a as a, like a stool. Um. All right. So Rocket Lettuce, continuing the theme of, uh, actually no, that was Biscuit Goat last time. So Biscuit Goat's PCs often do a um, an influence on the fly, and Rocket Lettuce wants to know about what you can do if a verbal duel happens on the fly. If like you know two people are walking along the street and one of them just like bites his thumb at the other one mm -hmm. and he's like do you bite your thumb at me sir no I sir i do, do but bite, bite my, my thumb, thumb but not at you <laughs> <laughs> do you quarrel sir <laughs> quarrel sir no, no sir. sir if you do sir i am for you i serve as good as man as you no better yes better you lie <laughs> all right so if that just this suddenly has been random shakespeare if this just suddenly happens in the middle of your session you will need to set the stakes and determine outcomes, and you just kind of have to figure out why the verbal duel happened. Was it just like one PC wanted to insult an NPC? Maybe the stakes aren't super high. But once you figure out, like, and honestly, a verbal duel does take a little while to set up, especially in PF1 where you have to recalculate. 
um, some numbers. So at the point when you ask the PCs to recalculate their numbers, that's when you figure out, well, I asked them to do this, so it was probably important that we do it. Yeah. What is going to be, um, what, is, what are the stakes here? So, so I guess, I guess that, that goes back to say if the PC just like points at someone in the streets, like you're a jerk, like that probably, that's not really going to warrant to bringing up the whole verbal duel system. But if like, you know, the PCs are, the PCs are in a grand committee and then they stand up and they make an accusation against, uh, against a prominent minister in public then like that's this big event it's also possible i guess that the pc would be a little more meta so they just point to the guy on the street you're a jerk i started verbal duel with him <laughs> I'm, from, I'm the wit bard archetype so i get bonuses in this oh, <laughs> <laughs> well you know if you have one player who just wants to have verbal duels with random npcs and go off on their own that's that's that, that's, I guess, the intrigue equivalent of the player who, like, wants to run off on their own and do their own adventures. And then the same general tips for players who run off on their own apply there. The ideas of, like, you know, talking to them about not splitting the party, potentially doing some little bits with them outside of the session. When I was playing Shuckled City, it wasn't exactly that, but I, we did have the intrigue equivalent of that player mm -hmm. in that uh, one of the players just really wanted to join this country club that's in cauldron and then he wound up spending like 30 minutes forcing the gm to quickly look up wines and stuff online like trying to buy different kinds of wine from the vintner mm -hmm. but this kind of stuff this kind of stuff can be fun <laughs> if you do it with that player off session i guess my stereotypical example is is spending like half an hour with a player for on their druid on their druid's journey to like talk to a six-year-old about religious matters the six-year-old's attention was only held that long because they showed that they had the ability to turn into a living flame. It was talking to a six-year-old gnome about about the joys of worshiping, <laughs> worshiping a, a rascal, rascal. Yes. Which worked because he turned into an elder fire elemental. <laughs> but still didn't really convert the gnome to a rascal. It just caused yeah, it the just gnome causes, to listen. Yes. <laughs> Wasn't it also a six-year-old gnome with, like, the Fae template? Yeah, and then it was, like, talking to the kid about the kid's misbehavior. Then there was a time you play hide-and-seek with the kids. And I basically decided, because that, that player was always saying, like, their character would solve every minute problem for people. He was a 15th-level druid. Yeah. He was the marshal for our kingdom and kingmaker. And no matter how small of a problem that Linda made... <laughs> The 15th level druid would just drop everything and do that thing. And so eventually Linda like enlisted me out of session. We just concocted <laughs> this village that was just full of these small, <laughs> smaller, more picky goon problems. Like, there was a hole in my yard. I think kobolds dug it. Those kobolds you had my joined the kingdom. My cat went up a tree. I can't find my cat. We're playing hide and seek and we can't find the person we're playing hide and seek with. It just went and on and on. He, and on. he did... All of them, no matter how small, but the one that he bought at, it wasn't even because it was small. It was actually probably less small than some of the other ones, but just because he got mad at the NPCs. So there were these, yeah. Two farmer brothers who just kept moving the, the milestone that was measuring where their land was. And then ending. one of them made the argument that, like, that by the river freedom, if you have what you hold, because his cows had wandered onto the other one's property, then that property belonged to him now. And then, well, the yeah, first one it. said he owned the cow because it was on yeah. his property and it was eating yeah. his grass. Second one said that his cow was having what it held, and it was the River Freedom. And That's what it took. But yes. the point is, the point and then is, he was like, you guys are brothers. Rastal teaches that families work together. You should be able to figure this out without me. So it wasn't even that it was too small for him. He was just mad that, that there were family who were in fighting. So the point is that players who like to go off on their own, sometimes you can have fun with them on out-of-session sessions. Um... But yeah, anyway, we should get we should get back to what why people actually came to this episode. Not hey, you know what? That's important characters. for an intrigue game, though, because you need to understand a character's motivations. Mm -hmm. And intrigue and you talked about an important tool for an intrigue game, which is sidebars. Mm -hmm. Sidebars are important, whether it's a chat, a note that you pass in between session. Having sidebars can allow you to add a little bit of mystery to the game, which is like the reason why so many of the PCs were on the list of who is the nice one, is that legitimately some of the players thought that there was at least a chance that some of the other players mm -hmm. were the nice one, since two of the players were becoming mass vigilantes yes. that were just not swans. So the idea is having <laughs> having channels for having channels for players to privately communicate with GMs and players to privately communicate with each other. It also can be interesting. 
Um, well, I mean, it also depends upon your group, right? How much you want to have Hayden versus open and how, wh how, how your group wants to deal with sort of that, that meta knowledge. Cause in some groups, it can be fun to have that metagame knowledge and just be like, hee hee, my character doesn't know all these things that I know. But in other groups, that metagame knowledge really could interfere with their enjoyment because they're having to constantly separate what their character knows from what they know. So working with your group to figure out where, where that line is for them can really help to make for a more enjoyable experience. Like, definitely Cedric's ninja in Jade Regent, all mm -hmm. the sort of evil things he did when he started worshipping Gazing instead of, uh, who did he start off worshipping, a rastal, um, who, or Iomidae, one of those lawful good deities. One of those lawful good deities. Um, yeah. Nobody else knew, mm -hmm. so then eventually when he realized he had lost everyone's trust and forced everyone to, to put him on trial and possibly <laughs> execute him, um, nobody, <laughs> actually, no, nobody actually knew what the truth was in the trial. And if you want to hear more about why we put one of our fellow PCs on trial for execution at his own request, then request the Jade Region episode, my Jade Region game, episode three. Yes, Mark's ga uh, games, episode three of Jade Region, because that totally happened in the in the more end part. Mm -hmm. But yes, that that was close. He actually was very close to um, to killing himself out of dishonor, mostly because he got caught, and he thought it would look bad for Amako. Mm -hmm. <laughs> However, um, in an entry game, that's the sort of thing that could happen. Everyone has their own motivations. There are different and unexpected outcomes. I didn't expect that he was going to mm -hmm. to possibly kill himself for that, but it and that was, was based all, on what the that was all initiated to do. by the player and what the what the player wanted to do. I also didn't expect him to demand a trial oh, for himself. Yeah. We just didn't know what was going to happen. So, let's see, we've talked about verbal duels, we've talked about influence. Um, the ultimate, Book of Ultimate Intrigue definitely has some other stuff that's in there, but it's not, um, it, a lot of them are about just setting up, like, heists, like, the structure of what a heist-based game looks like, and how um, heists, just like Leverage and Officials 11, often have PCs acting simultaneously, but in different places. The old adage, don't split the party, well, on heist, you usually have to. Mm -hmm. And generally, sort of, that means the adventure is structured in different ways. I think there's a diagram in there, in, in the book, that shows, like, the different circles of the different defenses. Mm -hmm. um, and then the PCs need to work out how each of them is going to play a different role yeah, and to get into the prize. Yeah, and sort of has that split the party in the sense that the players are acting independently. So in general, when you have a split party for, for, a split party for an intrigue system, because sometimes it's necessary, it's a good idea to sort of have a have a turn-taking mechanism, sort of like an initiative, ty an initiative type thing, um, where, you know, you have one player, then you go to the next one, you go to the next one, so everybody everybody gets their turn. And you're, you're mo you want to keep things moving at a, moving at a relatively rapid pace. And anytime that, anytime that characters go together, then of course you can, you can run their things together and have them play off of each other. Yep. And with heist, you, you make good use of cutscenes mm -hmm. and switches, just like actually heist movies and TV shows. And it's generally okay if everybody watches each of the different segments mm -hmm. happening, especially if the players can not metagame about the fact that, oh no, these people who were supposed to be and getting they, in position like, got, oh. got bought by like a, a, a groundskeeper who just wanted to talk to them for half an hour. And then, and then you can, and then you switch back to you and your character thinks that this, that they, that they disabled the security system, but they totally didn't. And so you're like, well, it's a good thing that they disabled the security system. And then you blunder right into it and you know, that's going to happen, but you're just like, ha ha. And, um, another thing, another thing with these kinds of systems is sometimes, um, Sometimes it takes players uh, longer to think about what they may want to do in an intrigue type setting than, than what they might want to do in a combat round. And so, especially when you have a thing where it's like, you know, and all the PCs act, having them be able to like delay and wait. And you can also, you can also have, um, if players want to, they can certainly ask other players for, for like advice and how to handle a certain situation or things like that. Cause you're not necessarily moving at the same, at the same pace of combat. Just as long as, as long as you're sure that, that if players want, if players want that advice, is a very important, is a very important, uh, very important aspect of this. Because you don't want you don't want players like trying to control each other's turns in in uh, intrigue and role playing encounters any more than you want that to happen in combat. That's true, and one thing that can help out 
if you have a player who just not doesn't have the type of thinking to like plot out these crazy things in advance they're definitely in pf1 not in pf2 yet some mechanics that are like i exactly as planned except i didn't really plan it out of character like mastermind type abilities that will give you the cutscenes in a good heist uh drama where it's like they show you the show and it looks like things are going bad but then they fl do a flashback cutscene. It shows that they had secretly set something up. And there are those kind of flashback cutscene style of abilities. Of like, actually, I brought a, a radish. Exactly the thing that we needed. How did you know we were going to need a radish? Well, in this flashback cutscene... Cut I remember. I remember that, that this radishes... Particular, uh, this particular NPC was allergic to radishes. Was allergic to radishes. So I secretly put this radish in his soup. Yes. Or, so, or you know, something like that. So, uh, and I think another thing to keep in mind is sort of the, uh, is sort of the fact that just because there is, like, roleplay in there, that not all roleplay necessarily needs to be fully acted out and things like that. Some players prefer to sort of, instead of speaking in character as their character, to sort of describe what their character does. Especially when people are newer to the game, sometimes they're not, if they're not comfortable with, they're not comfortable with the whole dynamic. So even just starting off with, or continuing if that's what the player prefers with something where it's like okay well how do you approach this you're not you don't just you don't just want the whole like i roll a diplomacy check do i win type stuff to happen because then there's not really something you can play off of but if the I, player in, says in like influence, yeah. you literally can't figure out what strengths and weaknesses to apply if yeah they, if they just so 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 the yeah so the idea is like you know i'm going to use diplomacy and i'm going to try to convince or i'm going to use profession merchant um, because I'm a merchant, I'm going to try to convince this other, I'm going to try to convince this NPC that we can make a lucrative trade deal. And, like, that's, so yeah, then you have the skill enough, you're using, that's enough you have the strategy you're using, you don't have to, like, play out the whole thing. So if you know that they like professional merchant, but they hate lucrative trade deals for some reason, then, yeah. you, you, then you, you have enough. Or they like lucrative trade deals, you have enough to know. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. And an entry game is definitely one where creativity is sometimes a little bit easier to add in because of the fact that in a lot of situations the goal is less straightforward than do damage when you need to do damage you can adjudicate weird creative actions to say that they, they're super effective mm -hmm. although you might want to create a rule that's like i'm going to allow this this time but we mm -hmm. don't want people to like take a mop into battles because this thing i allowed you to do with a mop is more powerful than or, like, you fighting. don't want people constantly collapsing the ceiling on top of people. Right. Or whatever the, the case may be. But in an intrigue setting where win and loss is not necessarily in damage, there's so many different things you can do. Like, hideous laughter is a good way to disable someone in combat. But if you cast it at, like, a funeral um, on, your <laughs> on, on your political rival, it can be <laughs> even more damaging than that where it's <laughs> like... The king, if dread was a very, <laughs> was a very, was very <laughs> Queen, Queen, Ilio, Queen Iliosa, why are you laughing at your husband's funeral? <laughs> Queen Iliosa, this is very inappropriate. We we're about to give you the the the, the crimson throne. Why are you? <laughs> king Idred built many monuments. Yeah. So um, you can definitely have an effect. <laughs> Titus laugh. I was totally doing the Titus laugh from that. <laughs> yep. There you go. <laughs> same pitch, same intonation, same same general duration. If you haven't played Final Fantasy X, there's totally clips of it online. It's like terribly voice acted laughter. <laughs> In an inopportune moment. <laughs> well, I guess in that case, it's like, let's cheer ourselves up by laughing, and then the rest of the PC. By like, laughing mm -hmm. in a strange way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that is another thing about entry games is you want to know what your tone is, because some people want entry games to be like serious business. This is a grim, dark world where there are shades of gray and politics, mm -hmm. and we decapitate the main character. And some people, an intrigue game is a good way to do hijinks. Like, Leverage, for example, has a very different, more upbeat feel to it, even though the rich and powerful get what they want, mm -hmm. um, than Game of Thrones. Yeah. So you want to know what kind of intrigue game you're playing, because just the fact that it's intrigue does not guarantee a tone. 
and that tone can be very thrown off if you have that the, the tedious laugh in, <laughs> in Game of Thrones. That, that's a real laugh for me. That not that shenanigans I just said. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so, funny laughter and sounds, and ha hamming it up can certainly be entertaining and intriguing as well. Yep. So, does anybody else have any more questions up from their own entry games? So, in that case, I think we can say goodbye to YouTube. Bye, YouTube! Bye!